Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining. At CIQ, we're focused on powering the next generation of software infrastructure, leveraging the capabilities of cloud, hyperscale, and HPC. From research to the enterprise, our customers rely on us for the ultimate Rocky Linux, Werewolf, and Aptainer support escalation. We provide deep development capabilities and solutions, all delivered in the collaborative spirit of open source. Happy Thursday. It is a happy Thursday. It is a wild and new Thursday, Mr. Zane. It is. Good to see you, Rose. It is very good to see you as well. Thank you, sir. So, so I'm um, assuming you hmm? saw some press release today? Uh, <laughs> I know. This is very, very exciting. And I imagine that we're definitely going to have some questions from the world specifically the Linux world on like, what does this mean? What is it? What is actually happening? Um, so yeah, give us a couple of details, just, just overarching. Sure. So uh, high level, well, you can read the press release. There'll be more coming out about this in the future, but uh, in cooperation with Oracle and SUSE Linux, uh, CIQ has entered into uh, a cooperation where we're going to actually have the Open Enterprise Linux Association. So open ELA. That's what it's going to be called. And that's going to be a place for enterprise Linux to have a standard for everybody to pull source code from to actually go build your compatible enterprise Linux distributions. Very exciting. Uh, it's a great thing for the community. And I'm, I love seeing this. I love having these large companies involved with us and helping helping us do this. It's very exciting. So thank you to Oracle and Suse. Thank you. Thank you, CIQ, Oracle, and Suse for coming together. Absolutely. <laughs> It's fantastic. It's really exciting. It really is so cool. So if you guys have any questions about that, you can go to our website or you can just go to the openela.org. And there is a lot of information there. You can join the Slack channel. You can join the movement. You can ask questions, all the, all the thing. So very exciting. Very happy to have you all. That is not what we're here to talk about today. No, no. We're actually going in a little bit of a different direction, sort of, because that kind of like, you know, having open enterprise Linux, right, available kind of supports a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Specifically, we're going in the direction of harnessing AI, machine learning in high performance computing. And so we're going to get into the details of that. But I think we have some friends here. Are we, are we adding some other people besides us? Yes, Alan in the house, Mr. Jonathan, Forrest, very excited. Thanks for being here. I, I simply came to this one because I know how much Alan loves this topic. And I just, I, I actually thought about bringing popcorn. I'm looking forward to this one. Welcome, Alan. <laughs> hey, um, no, it's nice to see all of you. And I, I'm just here to keep you guys in line. See? I, I love didn't it. realize. Thank you, Alan. I need you. Can I, can I, are you for hire to come to my house too and keep me in line the other day? Yeah, no, it's Alan. a great topic. It uh, gets a lot of uh, discussion. Why don't you introduce the topic, Zane? I'm sorry, Alan. I missed what you said. Uh, I don't think we know what we're talking about yet. Uh, we are talking about AI and machine learning and HPC. Okay, great. Your yeah, so favorite you topic. That that, out there. See? <laughs> yeah, I just... I don't know what you just, think about it. It's, you just join where anyway. You... Whatever you guys are talking about, I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> I love hey, it. You want to introduce, the, you want to introduce the others and we can launch it? Absolutely. Forrest, I feel like it's been a minute. How you doing? Great, Zane. It has been. Can everyone hear me all right? You can. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Zane. It's good to be back. I've been uh, out of the office for a little while, but yeah, excited to be back in this week and excited to once again be here at the, the roundtable. Thank you, Forrest. Jonathan. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a solutions architect here with CIQ and uh, know a bit about HPC, uh, a little bit less about AI. So I'm also uh, eager to hear more opinionated, uh, opinionated AI voices in this conversation and participate as best I can. Alan. Okay, well, I was hoping we'd get more. Uh, more. We have had some fantastic people on this uh, table over the last few years, and I was hoping you would pop in. Um, so this is, of course, a buzzword compliant topic. 
Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're moments away from the, the mashup of quantum and AI buzzwords. So um, watch for that to, to appear on your screen shortly. Right. Uh, you know, quantum AI startups are just around the corner. Right. So, um, so what I think I'll go back to exactly what you said, Zane, what, what do these terms mean? What, what do we mean by AI? Do we mean deep learning? Do we mean, you know, generalized uh, sorting algorithms? Do we need uh, generative learning? Do we need, uh, do we mean, uh, you know, linear regression? It's all linear regression, by the way. Um, do we mean, 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 mean predictive language models? What, what, uh, so I think the first thing we can do as a community that would be beneficial to everyone is the old high school debating tactic. Tactic You could always bring the other team to its knees by asking them to define their terms, right? <laughs> so what, uh, what are the, what do these terms mean? So I'll just, I'll just throw it right back at you guys. What, what do you mean by AI? What, what are you seeing it play out in the marketplace as, uh, let me ask it that way. It's a great question, Alan. Thank you for that. So uh, it's been fun, guys. I really appreciate you coming. Uh, we don't really have anything to debate anymore. No, I'm just kidding. I I'm going to let Forrest answer this because I feel like whenever we start talking AI, I typically default to Forrest. He spends a lot of time on this topic. Uh, he enjoys this topic. So my opinion, Alan, is it's all of those things. I think it depends on what part of that thing and what part of HPC are you looking at doing at that moment in time? So I feel like this could just be a never ending conversation, but I'll let Forrest have at it. Overall, I would say AI um, is a pretty broad definition in general. Like you said, Alan, are we including these, you know, kind of sophisticated, um, you know, framework based AI models that are built on something like PyTorch or something like that? Are we looking at more, you know, the use of mathematical models? You know, like I said, it's all regression in the end. Um, I tend to define AI as being uh, the genuine creation of one of these, you know, model-based architectures in some type of framework. So whether you're building, you know, one of these perceptrons, one of the more modern types of, uh, you know, large language model, GPT type things. Um, I kind of overall just, refer to AI as that catch-all of um, these specifically built, you know, usually layered to some extent, uh, neural network type architectures that uh, are a little bit more than just taking a bunch of data and applying, you know, a few different statistical models to it and kind of seeing, you know, what you can predict with that. Um, overall, I would say AI comes down to having that um, you know, neural net like architecture where you actually have uh, some type of, you know, you can go really deep with this, but you know, you've got activation functions, you've got neurons, you've got um, a thousand different ways that people do that type of thing. Um, so overall, I kind of, you know, look at AI as that um, layer based creation of some type of potentially autonomous agent trained on a specialized corpus of data. Um, for some type of purpose such that it can make informed decisions uh, on its own, on its own. Um, so that's kind of what I would say is machine learning is a little bit, um, you know, included in there is uh, more so I would say on the statistical side of things than it is the creation of artificial intelligence. Um, but I know some people kind of lump those a little bit more together. Um, I've kind of found in general that's sometimes a gray area. Um, but for me, AI is neural nets, the GPT type things, um, these sophisticated agents that are meant to take in some amount of data, learn something, <clears throat> um, and give you a more sophisticated result than just, you know, basic statistical modeling. Jonathan. Yeah, so I I'm with Forrest about AI. AI is pretty broad. Um, and I, I think of these as viewed from different perspectives. So to me, AI is most useful as a, a catch-all term for a user experience than any particular technology or, or field. It's, 
it's you know it, computers that are trying to interact with us with with the users of the computer like another person would let's say so you're you're talking with a an ai chatbot and your experience is more similar to uh speaking with another person than you might otherwise expect from from a machine things like that i'm a systems guy so where I look to these terms is to help me differentiate different parts of systems architecture. And so my definitions are less accurate than they are useful to me. So when I think of HPC, like if you just pull that term apart and you're like any high performance computing system, that's not useful to me. But when I think of HPC as that culture of computing that grew up in the kind of national lab space and the university space that kind of distilled itself down on something akin to a Beowulf model with a high performance interconnect and MPI, things like that. Uh, that's what high performance computing is to me is distributed memory, fast interconnect, running a process across multiple uh, system images. And so for me, when I think of machine learning, I'm less concerned with the actual machine learning, the application, and more, they're the guys who actually use the GPUs I installed. Uh, and so that that's most of where it begins and ends for me. They're also the guys that tend to fill up my storage, but then don't use my interconnect. And so that it, that's, that's where it breaks down for me is, is less like, that's not a useful definition of machine learning to anyone except for a sysadmin who draws the line at, well, the application does something, but what I know is it makes the GPUs get hot and fills up my storage. <laughs> It's great. Okay, Alan. Yeah, so, well, so, um, you know, uh, I think uh, there's so many directions. Um, thank you. Those are the answers I, I uh, wanted, and I think they're accurate. Um, the, the problem I think we have to face is that uh, we, we have to be aware of the fact that we're the folks with a hammer that in the proverbial, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Some people come along and say AI. We say HPC, right? So, uh, oh, you want HPC? So, uh, so um, you know, we have to be sort of careful what what they want. Um, what they seem to want is machines that think. And so, so this leads me to, um, to what Zane was expecting me to say. You know, uh, my uh, oft repeated uh, but I think still accurate statement that there is no AI. There is only. Uh, obscure scripting with unexplored failure outcomes. The problem with that that statement is it doesn't make a really good marketing t-shirt, right? So um, you can put it on a t-shirt, people long, would probably cool. buy it, but... Uh, but, we, we've, but made, you know, we've made freeloader t-shirts. Surely we can put yeah, that on t-shirts. Yeah, that's right. You guys are the experts go. in this. I'd so, buy one okay. of them. Uh, oh yeah, I'd be rocking that on the daily. Okay. So, uh, so you know, if you talk to this from the sales, you talk about different perspectives. So from a salesperson's perspective of hardware, software, you know, operating systems, whatever, it's, um, you know, what would you like it to be? <laughs> What's AI? What would you like it to be, right? So, um, you know, there's the uh, the famous Dilbert uh, comic strip. I, I try not to quote Dilbert much these days for various reasons, but uh, but I can't ever forget the one where the pointy-haired boss meets with the with Dilbert and his, his colleague and says, well, he says, uh, you know, We've just gotten our, uh, our consultant report, and he's identified our biggest problem. And Wally says, "You know, I recommend we build a tracking database." And uh, Dilbert says, "We can put it on the network." <laughs> and the boss says, "Would you like to hear what the problem is first? <laughs> That's <laughs> so, awesome. You know, we, we're sort of in that situation. What would you like it to be? Well, you know, uh, and the reason is it is a set of technologies, not a single technology. Sorry about that. Um, so. Um, I'm just going to let that ring and let the rest of you talk. I just point point that 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 aspect out, and then uh, you know um, we can. Oh, Fernandez here, good. So yes, you know, maybe we can talk a little more technically about what are the ingredients of AI and why we end up applying HPC to them. That would probably be a useful direction. Thank you. Welcome, Fernandez. It's good to see you. Hey, hi everybody. Hi. I'm just listening. I don't know what's happened so far. I was double booked. No, it's fine. So we're kind of discussing what is everybody's view of AI ML when it comes to HPC? So what does that mean to you? Uh, 
I mean, I think it's all HBC now. I don't think you can extract or differentiate uh, HBC from what's happening in even in the broader uh, workloads. Um, so they're all scaling now. They're all using GPUs. They're all uh, doing re really large data sets. So I don't think there's a difference between AI and HPC because I think it's all becoming HPC. It's very interesting. So what, one of the topics I know, Forrest, you and I talked about this quite a lot uh, at SC22. And we spent some time with a group who was doing a lot of data collection that we talked about. Wouldn't it be cool if... And I know, Alan, you don't like this topic either. That's why I'm going to talk about it. Having AI actually watch HPC infrastructure and stop problems before they happen or help prevent things or make oh, changes. Oh, I do, I do like that topic. I okay, so in the past, I thought we'd talk about not liking that. No, no, didn't I, want I don't okay. think we're there I think yet. that was me. That, oh, that was it Jonathan? Was, yeah. Okay, yeah. my apologies, Alan. No, I think this is a great topic. And my, okay. uh, my take on it in a, in a sentence is, I don't think we have enough information in, uh, uh, and we've been shy about getting it. And so a lot of my work in our industry, University Cooperative Research Center has been uh, drastically expanding the amount of monitoring um, information we get in a useful way. Uh, we had a supercomputing talk, I'll put a link up. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, two or three orders of magnitude more information from the baseboard management controllers. So you can do things like watch uh, memory power and CPU power separately on uh, tiny fractions of a second time scales without ever instrumenting your code. You know, getting, so what we work, uh, what I like to say is we work on precursors to AI. You know, you can't actually do, you know, anything really intelligent if you're only monitoring something once per second, right? You know, um, and uh, then the question is, what do you instrument and how do you get the data um, in, in, you know, in modern uh, clusters? Yeah, so I'll find a link and put it up. Thank you. Forrest, I don't know if you remember when we went and spent some a little bit of time having this discussion and the amount of data they were collecting, I feel like it was like, 66,000 pieces of data they were getting every second, something like that. It was some per minute gigabyte rate that was, was a I lot. was shocked to see or to hear about. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with that one completely. Uh, just like I say, precursors to AI, the biggest, you know, we have the model and then you have the data set, and one isn't particularly useful without the other. Um, and so without, you know, some massive corpus of data to actually look at that, like Alan says, gives us, you know, high granularity of what actually happens on a system that some type of agent can look at, try to determine trends from, you know, learn how to optimize a system based on. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of what stalled AI in general, as I understand, for a while. Um, you know, ImageNet and things like that were very big because they were some of the first times where people had collated all in one place, large, you know, for example, tagged data sets of images and things like that, that people could just go and use for AI. Um, so when <clears throat> those kind of things started to come around, we kind of saw this explosion of, you know, image recognition and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I completely agree. It's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of metrics and data that are left to be able to effectively collect on a system um, that we would have extremely large amounts of. I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> the basic um, corpus of data that the GPTs are trained on, uh, they call it the pile, which is this big, huge bunch of like random web, uh, like Stack Overflow, Wikipedia, stuff like that. <clears throat> I think it's like 770 gigabytes or something like that. So you can imagine, you know, in flat text, you know, if we can find interesting ways to compress down, you know, the specific types of data that we're pulling off of an HPC system, um, you can imagine, you know, the sheer amount of data that we would end up with there at certain levels of granularity. So, um, yeah, it a huge problem in it at the moment is there is no massive kind of organized um, corpus of metrics and data and things like that that something could actually look at and be trained over. Yeah, in addition to the link that I supplied, uh, there's uh, the, the toolkit called uh, "Like I Know What I'm Doing" L I K W I D Liquid. And uh, that that group has put together an astonishing variety of uh, tools and uh, and uh, you know uh, features. We're working with one of the vendors on uh, instrumenting um, MPI code uh, in a more natural way. 
uh, again, without interfering with the code, you don't have to compile anything in. You just use Linux perf and MPI uh, tracking. And uh, so you, we can do things like, uh, you know, many of the things you'd have to normally uh, dive into total view and do. So let me wind back though. My criticism about AI is that, uh, and the reason I say it doesn't exist is that what we have uh, in, in general are things that uh, can be trained, uh, everyone feel free to disagree with me, but they can be trained on pre-existing data or models and used to predict the next most logical outcome. In the case of uh, you know, languages, uh, you, you predict the next most likely phrase or sentence, uh, uh, whether or not it actually makes any sense. So there's no thinking behind it. That's my, my criticism. Same thing with art, you can train it and it can make art, but it's basically just a plagiarism as a service, right? So, um, you know, so I don't think we are anywhere near actually getting machines that think, but going back to what you said, Zane, I think that problem is highly approachable. Machine learning based steering of computational codes has been a, a positive influence on those codes in a long time. Think about minimization algorithms, you know, you can write something to try to approach minima or you can throw machine learning at it and the latter approach. When you have those constrained problems, it's eminently sensible. People write code with, with AI uh, these days and you know we even have a whole major repository framework that does that, steals your code and gives it to so other I people. Actually, but, uh, I wanna come back to that, Alan, because I think it's an interesting topic and kind of diving in a little yeah. bit to what you were doing and having to not instrument code, but I want to get Fernanda's opinion on this too. Are you comfortable letting AI make decisions on your HPC cluster? Um, <laughs> not if it's a production system. Um, if it's a research system where, um, you know, a few jobs get lost and they have a 24 hour, you know, cap on running, sure. If it's um, something that I'm running some, you know, week long computational chemistry code or running something that makes planes fall out of the sky, then no. No, I agree. I don't, I don't want that either. So I think we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to go back to Alan's. If I can touch on something Alan said there really no, quickly, yeah. I just wanted to mention that, uh, especially like, you know, coming up on a year post chat GPT release. It has become incredibly apparent that these systems are not the, um, you know, dynamic answering engines that we perhaps anticipated them at, uh, to be at the start of it. But there is a lot more of just kind of, you know, the prediction of the next most likely uh, word in the chain. Essentially, people have seen kind of the quality of some of these major AI systems, like it can't pick out prime numbers and stuff like that anymore. Versus versions of it that were out months and months ago. Um, and they are completely unable to solve the problem of hallucination in the end, even with all the resources and time and stuff that these places are putting into it. They are unable to stop it from just making stuff up at random. So yeah, it turns out... it's unsolvable. Yeah. yeah, I think it's completely mm -hmm. unsolvable. Because yeah, in the end, just like you said, Alan, it's not... This is this is not machines thinking. It's just some agent predicting what the next most likely thing in the chain is. Uh, the big misconception is that these things don't know anything. They just know what a lot of people have said about something in a certain case. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to say I completely agree there. There's there's not really genuine thinking. It's, you know, sophisticated Markov chainers and stuff like that, essentially, in the end. Yeah, you could, you could point the you could point that uh, criticism in both directions on the uh, human boundary, right? <laughs> you know, you have to keep in mind that the stuff that we're being trained on comes from us and we're not exactly a source of truth ourselves, right? So thank you. Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> <laughs> well I was gonna present say, company included. that's the way that I think. <laughs> I don't know how you think, but I only have access to what I have but right seen her. We are a source of chaos. But we do it. Not a source but of we truth. do it already. I mean we we've been, we've been writing script I said it's obscure scripting with unexplored failure outcomes. Right. So we've been doing, you know, hopefully a little less obscure scripting. Uh, with hopefully less obscure failure outcomes for a long time. This is not new, right? We're applying some predictive and, and uh, neural net based, you know, machine learning techniques to it. So, you know, I, I give the example of hierarchical storage management. We've been 
you know, for years, these, the, the problem has been in, in, in place and solutions have been fielded to, uh, you know, make sure you fetch the right data for the next part of the calculation. Uh, so, you know, it's not that different. But the question is, uh, you know, uh, so, so it, let's go back to the original thesis of the, of the webinar, right? Uh, is AI useful in, in managing HPC? I think absolutely yes. Um, but, you know, are, is it, is it uh, AI in the sense of machines thinking for you? Arguably no. It's an interesting take on that, Alan. Thank you. Fernande, do you have something you wanted to add? So you come off mute before. No, I was saying that we're a source of chaos. We're not really a source of truth. Um, and there's not a lot of people spending a lot of time rebalancing data. Um, we're still in the, especially now in large language models, we're still in the realm of dump everything and the kitchen sink into something and hope it comes out. And um, until we start to refine um, our data and rebalance our data, we're not going to get better answers. We're just going to continue to see the kinds of answers that you would expect if you asked, you know, a thousand people on the street. Absolutely. We want to throw the question back up. We have a few questions to get to. So the, uh, I, I think this question is in response to my, my statement earlier about HPC being about distributed memory. And just at, in case that is it, to be clear, um, what that means in my experience uh, isn't any particular technology about distributing the memory. It's not a large unified but distributed memory space. It's, it's a partitioned memory space that you then let... Uh, um, let processes speak into each other's memory uh, with RDMA remote direct memory access, usually over some kind of fabric using MPI, uh, or in other cases, uh, some kind of PGAS or, or gas net system. So that is what I think the answer to this is. But uh, I'm not familiar with using Plan 9 to create a RAMFS uh, that you would then share with a control node. Yeah, but points for recognizing the abbreviation. True. I don't. I didn't know that it was. Uh, I, I don't know that I'd seen it written the other way around. But uh, it was at least enough to make me confirm. And okay, yes, I haven't run Plan Nine myself though. Uh, you, you certainly know where the name comes from. Oh yes. Oh good. Now we all have to know, Alan, because I don't. Really. It's Plan 9 for Oh, it's a space. famous old uh, black and white oh. uh, um, science fiction movie, the Plan 9 from Outer Space. I'm going to go back and rewatch it. I don't. I hadn't even thought of that movie in so long. It's not even... I have to go back and watch it. What if you can stream that? Yeah, I have a, what are the I have odds? a friend who lost years to Plan 9. So. <laughs> we have another question. Okay, I like it. Sylvie, thanks for watching and uh, writing in a question. So maybe Fernanda, we'll start with you. How is chat GPT used and involved in HPC in your experience? So I don't have an HPC specific example, but it's a possibility for HPC. We just wrote a blog over at Voltron Data, uh, the startup that I'm at now, where one of my engineers in my group um, augmented data uh, the data set that we use is very common open data set, which is um, the IMDb uh, open data set. So list of movies, stars, right, stuff like that. And what they did is they added a column <clears throat> and then used ChatGPT to give a synopsis of each movie. And then in that column, you know, basically each movie now got augmented or at least the entire data set got augmented with that. And I was thinking about how we could do that with any other language model, because, you know, if we take the perspective of AI is compression and we can compress uh, other kinds of data, we could get richer data sets that have, um, you know, uh, extra features added on to these data set uh, um, that we can use then to compute on. Is it going to be, you know, great? Is it going to be 100% correct? I'm sure that if we went deep down and looked at the synopsis of each movie, it wasn't going to be perfect. But it's it's a preview of what we can do with augmenting data sets, especially data sets that have been historically, you know, lacking. Um, I can think of examples in projects that I've been in in healthcare where you have missing data, 
um, you know, maybe those, those data can have, we can have a better model by completing some data with like demographic information or address or city, some sort of expectation of where that person might live based on other things that are within those data. So maybe we might have state missing, but we have the city, stuff like that. And I can see us getting a better and more complete data than leaving it with nulls and, and then removing them completely because I've got nulls, right? It's very cool. Thank you. I haven't thought about it that way. Forrest, I know you yeah, have so thoughts actually, on GPT. Sorry, I'll go ahead. Oh, so it's easier to answer the other uh, the question in the other order, right? How is HPC used in, in these kinds of algorithms? Uh, you know, going back to the, um, so how is it used? the sales technician's response, you know, how would you like it to be? <laughs> So what is what is HPC's role in ChatGPT right now? Forest. It would it would be everything. Yeah, bulk um, processing, right? Yeah, I mean everything. The I mean it's um you know, Chat GPT exists probably in some way, shape, or form as between one to maybe half a dozen single files sitting on some system out there that something is running inference on. Mm -hmm. And that file is almost assuredly created, that model. Uh, based on, you know, heavy computation on GPUs. You can look at, like, um, their partnership with Azure, I think, uh, to bring more cloud computing into that whole project. Um, another example that's not GPT-related but just is kind of emblematic is that uh, Tesla runs a 5,000-node HPC system called Dojo with a whole bunch of custom silicon uh, that they have in it called the Dojo chip. Um, that just is, sits there and dedicatedly trains AI. Um, so at the moment, you know, not only are we seeing the massive repurposing of things like GPUs, when we have, you know, eight, 16 cores on the system, it's much more efficient to not be using, you know, multi-threaded, pipelined, highly sophisticated CPU cores to do tiny little, you know, basically multiply some operations over and over again. It's much more efficient to do the thousands, millions of those that we need to do on the thousands of cores in a GPU. Um, and so the GPU, you know, like you've said, Alan, has become this kind of generic computing device for a lot of different workloads, um, not only just AI for all kinds of different workloads. Um, but something interesting about AI is we're seeing a lot of development, uh, like novel engineering in HPC um, around creating devices beyond the GPU uh, that are ultimately a GPU-like architecture, you know, a whole bunch of little tiny cores sitting on a chip, um, but that are essentially dedicatedly made to just train AI. Um, and so overall, yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> we see, like I said, the GPU has become, you know, I mean, the de facto standard in uh, the AI world for what you do your AI training on. And those are mostly involved within the purview of HPC systems. Um, and like I said, not only that, but the entire industry of HPC is in like a technological renaissance at the moment trying to build um, you know, the Cerebras, the Habana, all these different um, dedicated little AI chips. Um, so it's, yeah, just like it's, it's huge. It is. The industries are completely intertwined, like you said, Fernando. You can't really differentiate the two of them at this point. They're, it, it, everything AI that you see is powered by an HPC system ultimately in one way, shape, or form. Right. We should probably make the distinction. Uh, sometimes you see the criticism in the media about uh, oh, every time you type a chat GPT query, you're using up so much carbon or something. That that part doesn't use processing. It's the part you're talking about, Forrest, which is the training and the inference and the developing of the models where a lot of computer science goes on. People you know, run on our GPUs to develop these algorithms. And then when they get a good one, they think they train it. So when you actually just type a query, you're not burning a lot of carbon. You're You're just basically doing a web search uh, among, uh, well, a database search in the, in the results. So uh, you shouldn't feel too guilty about asking it to draw a new picture for you or something. Thank you, Alan. Jonathan, before I ask my next question. Yeah, I, I don't have much insight or experience in how chat GPT is used in HPC today. I mean, we've, we've done mundane things like using it as a glorified search engine for config file syntax and things like that, or, or helping us to develop containers in 
uh, containerization languages that, or you know, definition languages that we have maybe less experience in. But that that's pretty well understood. I did have one idea though, as the conversation was happening. So you know, I I acknowledged I've been um, critical is probably too strong. I've been skeptical of attempts to use general machine learning for fault tolerance or, or sorry, like fault prediction and failure prediction and avoidance in HPC systems before, not because I think it's a bad idea, but I just, I've seen multiple projects targeted at that and none of them come to anything. And I do think like Alan said, it's, it's largely a, a data issue, but in my experience, it's also just been a putting the right people on an issue. I've experienced it as a side project of a systems team uh, or a purely academic experience that's not collaborative with a systems team. So I, I think there's there would be value in continuing to pursue that either at a commercial level as a product um, or um, as, as a joint research effort that has a bit more interaction than I've seen before. Um, but I, I was thinking, you know, we, we mostly experience uh, GPT and, and its ilk um, as, as a conversational system uh, or at most it, like it, it generating something that you would generate and now you don't have to. Uh, but I would be interested how, how effective it would be. And I don't know, I'm not an AI researcher, but I would be interested how effective it would be to train it on machine log data or maybe even machine telemetry data and then have it predict future log telemetry or, or log data and then use that prediction to highlight divergences from the expectation. And, and I, I think most of these systems, most AI systems are best thought of as a tool to enhance, you know, an, an, other, an existing operation, something operators will do. And there's so much data, you know, if you, you get all this telemetry data out of a BMC, like Alan was saying, and now what do you do with it? You need something that's going to help call out the important information out of that. And uh, that, that's what I would be really interested to see, not necessarily for it to take automated action, though, maybe eventually that would make there are some areas where that's already happening. Um, but at the very least, to start maybe as an evolved grep that's showing you these are the things that diverged from what we expected or that, you know, more than some error bars expectation on either side of it. These are log messages that are divergent from the norm and someone needs to take a look at them. That could be really interesting. Yeah, I think that would be uh, the general statement I want to make about that is if you have a closed form system, I don't know exactly how to phrase it mathematically or, or with that kind of language, but if you have something that's a closed form, like uh, Forrest mentions uh, uh, writing set in ox scripts, you know, so, uh, you know, say anything like that where there's, there's a complicated step to be done, but it's completely um, within a set of existing examples. Um, or in your example, you know, it departs from the existing examples. Those, I think, are solvable problems. And that's where I think uh, the short-term win is. Um, you know, Fernanda has been typing in our chat, and she made the interesting point that, uh, all, that AI is uh, basically compression. You want to expand on that, <laughs> oh, so to speak? I, I think that's the thing that, um, like, gave me a light bulb moment about three, four years ago when somebody mentioned that AI is compression. And then uh, there was actually a chat on in our company's, uh, you know, Slack, where somebody had presented a paper um, just this, uh, this year, not, you know, just a few months back, where they had used GZIP as essentially their model. Um, and, and they were able to, you know, query it and do things with it as, as if it were um, an AI uh, model that they built. So interesting that um, that we keep talking about AI as some sort of revolution, but I think in the end, we're going to find it's a lot simpler than that. It's just uh, trying to get things closer together and, um, you know, just go on in that next little node in a graph and it's just a really giant graph that we don't know what it looks like inside, but um, it's able to just kind of make leaps and bounds in, the, in those little nodes and, and in a giant graph and then tell us an answer and whether or not it takes a wrong path. Sometimes it just um, it depends on the kind of prompt that you uh, that you put, or even how you word your prompt, uh, will take you a different path altogether. So, Fernando, are you saying that this is going to be like virtualization was, and then containerization was, where we were doing it on mainframes years before we had any kind of virtualization? Right. But it's the new thing. It's the new thing, exactly. Uh, but I think I don't know if 
it made AI to me feel more mundane. Uh, it, it's just a fancier way to do compression that's not a deterministic algorithm. Thank you. Do we have another question that came in? From art. Oh, the economics change. Well, they already have. It's the Dickens to try to get a GPU these days. <laughs> have uh, you seen the prices of GPUs? <laughs> yeah, and it's let's be clear. It's all it's all driven by the fact that the um, the major um, cloud providers uh, made massive investments in huge uh, amounts of hardware because of anticipation of uh, of this AI need. Uh, so it's already changed the economics by making the parts scarcer. Uh, in terms of on-prem versus cloud, uh, listen, I always say that when someone invents another form of transportation, you don't stop using the previous forms of transportation. You change the balance of how you use them, maybe. But, you know, flying cars may come along and, and you will probably still have bicycles and trains and stuff. So how does that apply to AI and ML? It's another application of, of HPC. It's what Fernando has been saying. We've been saying as a group, uh, you know, you need HPC to solve these problems. Apart from the part shortage, I don't actually see any, you know, first order change to the, the balance of how you use this stuff. Uh, lots of researchers, you know, here and at other universities use the local systems. The clouds are still as expensive as they were. Uh, that's why they bought all that hardware to sell you time on. Um, so I don't see it changing the balance myself. I want to reframe this question though, because I want to challenge Arthur's uh, comment that the innovation is being driven by an AI and ML. HPC is what drove AI and ML. It was putting down Titan and having a project with NVIDIA to put those same math libraries, same linear algebra libraries that were running old timey AI ML frameworks that were sort of okay. And then we put them on GPUs. And then somebody said, you know, I could use the same Blas, Laypack, whatever math library it is that they originally put in there, and they can substitute it for GPUs. And that was what exploded AI. So the innovation came from HPC. And we've known this for years. We're sort of this, you know, um, we're in this field where people think we're we're old timey field. Oh, you're still doing Fortran, but we continue to drive innovation and we continue to be left behind as if the innovation is not being driven by us, but, you know, passing us by AI isn't doing uh, anything to change what we're doing. We're doing a lot to change AI. Um, and I wish more people would uh, appreciate the kinds of um, deep, you know, algorithm work that we're putting into scaling all of that stuff I mean, even like Horovod, right? Horovod was the first scalable framework for AI, for training, right? That uh, was it, um, uh, the, the driving company built. It was built on MPI. We built these tools. We're the ones that are driving this kind of innovation. A lot of stuff that's running today, even in a large hyperscaler, still using TCP. They're not using, you know, the sorts of uh, communication frameworks that we've built in HPC. We're the ones driving those innovations. They're, you know, NVIDIA is hiring people from our field. Lots of the hyperscalers are hiring HPC people. In fact, we're struggling in lots of places and labs and whatnot for HPC people. We're the ones driving this innovation. AI is a consequence of HPC. It's not driving HPC. Anyway, that's my so. I don't even know how you follow that up. I mean, that's like <laughs> a great way to end. I, yeah, exactly. Mic drop. I'm sorry, we're done now. Oh, that was awesome. Thank you, Fernando. It's a great perspective. I really don't even know how to follow that up because that was perfect. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's well, I'll follow it up with a, a link because I absolutely agree with everything Fernando said. Um, so if you're curious how to learn these, uh, I love the old timey <laughs> AI ML method. I just did a picture of 1890s AI ML here. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's a reference that I put in the in our chat that maybe someone can put up in the notes uh, from uh, Andrew Ng's uh, Stanford uh, Computer Science 229 course last spring. It's uh, it's a PDF of his lecture notes, uh, 
and it just is an absolutely great uh, precise, uh, you know, covering all these basic uh, techniques, uh, including the ones we started this conversation with. Uh, you know, what do you mean by neural nets? What do you mean by machine learning? What do you, you know, what are the various forms of predictive algorithms? Um, so uh, I wish we had, I wish I could come up with an inspiring, oh, but AI will someday be a, a thinking conscious uh, counterpart. Uh, all I know is if that day ever comes, then uh, you know all those prove you're not a robot captures. <laughs> We're gonna have some explaining to do. <laughs> yes, no kidding. Freddie, you mentioned a blog earlier uh, from a colleague recently. Did you want to post a link to that? Uh, did I mention it? No, I mentioned that paper. Are we talking about that? No, nope, I thought early on there was another blog that someone that you work with had posted. Um, oh, right. Was... Oh, yeah, I can do that. If you I'll want to share that, that we can the, post that in the show too. notes. Yeah. Yeah. Be hey, great. Thank you. Well, we are getting close on time, and I think Fernando wrapped it up perfectly. So. <laughs> I will give everybody the option to say something if you want to, but I don't know that you're going to top that. Jonathan's not on mute. Sure. Uh, so the only thing that I'm, this kind of still resonating with me, you know, uh, Alan has, has challenged here uh, repeatedly the, the kind of notion or what we expect of, of AI systems that we build and, and how we conceptualize them and what they're capable of. And, you know, this, this is a little bit off topic here, but I I like to use that as a reflection of what we're actually doing when we think and we conceptualize. And, and the more capable we make our machines, the more we understand about what it is that we're doing that's different. And uh, I I look forward to continuing to be challenged uh, in, in how we think and conceptualize the world as we compare it to the machines we build. I think it's a, a really interesting opportunity to learn more about ourselves. Thank you, Jonathan. Anyone else before Rose wraps us up here? No, thanks for letting me start with uh, with my criticisms because I think it, it <laughs> allowed us to go in, in the direction of what is it actually good for? And Absolutely. we've only just scratched the surface. There's a tremendous number of application areas and you know, uh, Sturgeon's revelation, right? 95% of everything is crap. So yeah, 95% of AI is crap, but you know, that's par for the course. Right? So uh, we're looking for the good stuff and there are lots of very clever people doing really great work. I don't want to diss them at all. Absolutely. Good point. You know, um, Boris, you have, we've had conversations about this before and I, I brought it up to him. I was like, so like, are, are, do we need to be afraid? Right, because there is like AI is going to take over. This is the one thing you should be afraid of, and there's like a lot of that kind of chat. And and Fernando, you just said it so well, and it was one of the things that that Forrest really said. He's like, well, you have to remember that it's like it's people that are creating these these algorithms, right? And so it's it you you got to take it back and and realize that you know we are we are creating this the way that it is. So I don't know, maybe if you wanted to like rephrase that in your own words for us, I think it probably, you said it better. People are generating the data. These uh, AI models and, and types of um, methods that we have, and you know, if we look at the show notes, uh, uh, Andrew Yang's, uh, um, you know, lecture notes, these are all statistical methods that have been around for a long time. There's nothing really new about AI other than speed. Speed is what made it possible. The increase in memory is what made it possible. The capacity of, uh, of systems and nodes is what made it possible. Even the interconnect can be slow right now and is still making it possible, the, the, you know, the slight speed up. Data collection ability, digitalization of data, that's what made AI possible. There's nothing really new here. It is a convergence of many things that it makes it more possible today. So I think we need to be a little bit less um, scary, scared of AI, a little bit more skeptical that it can give us any new insights or new innovation. It might speed up the innovations that would have happened anyway. 
agree completely. It's mostly an imitation engine in the end. And just like, you know, Fernando, a lot of these techniques have been known since like the 60s, 70s, 80s. They were researching these things. And it's only just been with massive storage and computation that we've been able to actually research and act on them. So, yeah, um, like I said, in a post one year after GPT or so, chat GPT is out. Um, yeah, we're all still here and stuff. So, yeah, it's it uh, it's definitely not, you know, the boogeyman that it's turned out to be. It's it, like I said, it's mostly just collections of techniques that we finally have um, the resources to be able to apply to in the end. But we could get innovation if we can get better data. And that's the next level. Right now, it's dump everything and the kitchen sink. Next level is going to be be more discerning about your data, be more discerning about the balance of your data. And again, to reference again, Andrew Yang, and I think I referenced him the last time I was here, is the, his whole premise now, his whole startup now is better data. That you don't need behemoth models. You can do better with smaller data sets and you can actually do a lot better in terms of supporting, say, industrial applications where you have very low signal to noise ratio. Um, then let's move on to the next stage. Like the novelty is great. Uh, we can chat with these robots and sound pretty human, but let's move to the useful part of this stage now. <laughs> True. <laughs> Take that. That's a quote. <laughs> we can make that into a little short. <laughs> yeah, I like all kinds of t-shirts coming out of today. Up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of t-shirts. I, I think a lot of nice uh, snippets for your little snippet series. What do you call it? Uh, you can the, call shorts? It a, the shorts. Yeah. The shorts. Yeah, they're oh, great. Yeah. Snippet series. Absolutely. I like that, Alan. See, we're just, we just are on fire today. Keep going. Oh my God, you guys, thank you so much. Super fun conversation. I know that we could probably talk for another few hours about this, but appreciate your time. Thanks for being here and make sure that you like and that you subscribe, put in any questions that you have, follow us all over the place, reach out to CIQ. We're happy to chat with you more about everything HPC and get all of your systems supported and all the cool things that we do. We love you very much. We'll see you here, same time, same place next week. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.